dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunitz, and this is Dr. Margarita Ochamaya and Dr. Laura Chan. And we're delighted to have you with us today. Our topic for this show is about sleep and how sleep affects our health and well-being. And you know, I think we can all relate to sleep because we really burn the candle at both ends sometimes, don't we? We do. And I, I can tell you, you know, we hear more and more on the radio and television about stories of, you know, uh, people falling asleep, truck drivers falling asleep, the people that watch the planes and whatever falling asleep. And I can tell a brief story, which I think will relate with all our audience. Not long ago, I was literally burning the candle at both ends and coming back from seeing a loved one who was ill and on the way back on the highway, thinking I was absolutely fine and doing well. It was at the time of the year where the um, clocks go back and it gets dark early. And I was coming back because I had to go to a meeting, and I fell asleep at the wheel. And the wow. next thing I knew oh is gosh. that I was off the road, and I heard the, you know, and it popped up, and I had no idea that I had fallen asleep. So what does oh that gosh, say? How, How many of us are walking around so tired, and we don't even know where something like that would happen? Absolutely. It scared the ever-living daylights out of me, and I'm sure it happens to many, you know, these things happen where we don't know how sleep-deprived we are. And this is a perfect topic for us. So Absolutely. I was wondering how we should begin by speaking about the medical aspects, because we know that if we don't have enough sleep, right, it can cause disease, right. a variety of diseases. So why don't we start there and then get into how it affects the entire body and how much is good sleep for us? How do we know how much we need and what happens? So which one of you wants to start in on this one? I'll jump in because okay. I want to add on to your story, your personal story. When I was learning to drive and getting ready to get my driver's license, my dad used to say to me, if you're tired, it's just as bad as if someone's been drinking. Yes. So I don't want you driving if you're tired. He would yes. say, call me or take a taxi. And that really stuck with me because that comparison between alcohol impairment and being sleep deprived, I think there's a really good point there that yes. when you are really fatigued, there's a level of impairment that's similar to when someone's been drinking. And so one long-term impact of sleep or short-term is that cognitive impairment where you can't think as clearly and you just can't function as well. And of course, you notice it maybe the next day after a poor night's sleep, but over a long period of time, we really can have um, neurodegenerative or, or where the brain isn't functioning as well. Those types of conditions can be one thing that come up from chronic sleep deprivation. And from the point of view, even when you think about it, of the development of a child, from the time that they're born, from the brain perspective, the need for sleep, and what's happening in the process over a lifetime related to the need for sleep. Maybe you can talk about how Absolutely. physically it all plays out. Well, what is most interesting is actually with sleep deprivation, people can actually die. The longest the person wow. has been able to be without sleep is at maybe at the most 10 days. Yeah. So it's extremely it's like, you know, consecutive no and, wow. and, no and it's life-threatening. Wow. wow. Life-threatening. So how important that is with regards to sleep is because when we sleep, the brain resets. So interestingly, the brain continues its activity, but in a whole different level. There are several uh, cycles of sleep, and it, the whole brain cycles four times, and that over a period of two hours, pretty much, you have several cycles. So we have the first phase of sleep, which is when you start like drifting off, and some people are somewhat conscious, but then at the same time, the brain is now going in a different wavelength. And so when we do a sleep study, for example, we can analyze the different wavelengths of the brain. The fourth and most important one is called rapid eye movement, and when that fourth cycle is actually impaired, people would wake up and feel like they never rested. So it not only is important to sleep 
and not take it, you know, some people take it for granted and use a lot of screen time or sometimes even with nurses who do shift work, doctors who do shift work, mm. or people who have shift work in different companies, the sleep deprivation can be quite crippling. It can really affect their whole lives. And it's not uncommon with uh, sleep deprivation. Isn't it so that obesity can occur as part of Absolutely. the medical problems? And is it true that diabetes can be developed with Absolutely. sleep deprivation? What other things can occur? Heart disease Heart and hypertension. Disease. That's right. Mm -hmm. Hypertension sleep. specifically. And after menopause, when we talk about with hormonal changes, mm -hmm. in the area of perimenopause mm -hmm. and after menopause, usually actually the most com impaired situation is sleep. They have studied that hot flashes where we don't perceive them while we're sleeping will seriously impact those phases of the sleep cycle and therefore fatigue ensues. Also, thyroid disease can, affect, mm. uh, can be affected by lack of sleep. So we have obesity, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease, and of course menopause. And what ends up happening is we don't know which is first, if it's the medical condition causing the insomnia or, the sleep, deprivation. or sleep deprivation. And how many hours of sleep is actually enough? How do or, we know? Or at least a minimum necessary. A minimum. So, I, I mean, I've heard a variety of... You mentioned children. Yes. And most importantly, as children, they need to sleep at least maybe sometimes 18 hours a day. And the little babies. The little ones. babies, yeah. yes. That's a lot of sleep. It's a lot of a sleep. Lot of and sleep. as we grow, actually there is a saying, actually, you will grow when you're sleeping. Right. Mm. So very that's important. That's true, and that's why some see a difference from the, when you put down the baby to the Yeah, morning. that's yeah. right. They, they grow. <laughs> they grow. It's true. <laughs> but on that note, I mentioned the word insomnia. So insomnia is the medical term that we use when somebody has difficulty sleeping. And mm. there are different types. There's the difficulty initiating sleep when mm. the brain is going on and on and on. And then the other ones is that they do go to sleep, but then... Surely enough, around 1 a.m. in the morning, they're wide awake. And so one is induction of sleep, and the other one is maintenance of sleep. So the minimum requirement, I think, should be at least five hours. But then thereafter, of course, ideal would be at 8 to 12. I was reading for teenagers, they need at least 9 to 10, which is right. so difficult for teenagers because they often will stay up later, and then their demands for school may require that they have to get up earlier. And it can be really difficult. I know that... Uh, when we had discussions about when students should begin going to school, when you think about it, the younger ones are up early in the morning. But the older ones that are in the junior high to high school, they're up late. Actually, mm -hmm. it would be most beneficial for their own learning process to be able to start school later versus go earlier just because of their cycle. And then, of course, the sleep cycle changes when we change back the clocks or put them ahead. Right. Everybody right. kind of gears that. Now, you were speaking about babies and the baby's need for more sleep. Well, also, as we go through different cycles of our life, for instance, when you have a baby, your sleep pattern changes completely related to having to get around the clock with the baby related to feedings and everything else. So there goes the cycle again of how, and, and depending upon the stress of work or whatever else, what were you going to I say? I was just going to say, interestingly, uh, postpartum depression sometimes is highly mm. associated with sleep deprivation. There we go. That's so right. what, what are the things that can be done for that? Well, most importantly, I think, is understanding the term sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is being able to understand that it's not really good, a good idea to, while you're in bed, watch TV, for example. Right. A lot of people use the TV as a method by which they would actually maybe put their mind at ease, distract themselves, and think that that's going to help them go to sleep, but it's not a good idea. And how about the iPads and the iPhones and the texting? That's Absolutely. another thing, the computer. I mean, everybody yep. is... Tuning out the, from the wire. Right. And, and along those lines, if I can jump in, I yes, um, read a study that's reading the e-books that a lot of people have, the Kindles and the Nooks, that people reading those before bed don't fall asleep as well or sleep as deeply as people reading paper books because of the electronic, the shortwave light that's coming from that. I thought that was interesting. Yes, yeah. that is interesting. And also not to do anything that is negative. No negative thoughts, negative words, negative music, negative anything. And really having it very positive and also to take the time to allow the body to unwind. You mentioned that rest. about the, the lights, actually. Um, the, there's a very strong blue light emitted by the screens, both TVs, Kindles, iPads, 
or computers, and that also includes the t television, these blue lights actually reduce melatonin, which is a very important hormone of sleep. So it is usually can be found as an over-the-counter supplement, but melatonin is a hormone produced in the brain that is related to vitamin D, which is related to the sun, and what's something called the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is how we relate our body and our hormonal function in reference to the sun. And we tend to be creatures in which before Edison, who invented the lights, we would actually go down and go to sleep when darkness ensued. Farmers now, hours. due to the lights, right. now yep. some people might have some more difficulty. It's right. true. Well, when you think of our country's history with the farmers and everything, they rose at the time that the sun came yep. up, and they went to bed when the sun went down. And, and now we have clock. much more artificial environments. We do. That are we really confusing we... to our system. So. We, we spoke about the medical issues that arise from sleep. We talked about, uh, ideally speaking, when we're younger, we need more hours. And then, but de also depending upon as we're growing up and aging, we require yep. um, perhaps a little yes. less or at least eight hours. And then for the teenagers, requiring a little more sleep. So what do we do if we actually can't get sleep? We have people working two jobs, sometimes mm -hmm. three jobs, to try yeah. to keep their stress. livelihoods. Right. We know that stress is a really key component of a lack of sleep. We also know that people who don't exercise also can have difficulty right. sleeping. So from your perspective of the people that you see in your practices related to this, what are the best things that we can do to help people in dealing with sleep and helping them to realize that making sleep a priority is important for their health and well-being. What would you both recommend? Well, Margaret used the term sleep hygiene, and yes, I think that I like that's that. so important. I think so, too. We, you know, we take care of our personal hygiene. We shower, we bathe, and um, sleep requires an element of hygiene as well in the sense that we need to prepare for it and allow our bodies to respond in such a way that we can drift off into sleep. And I'd be really interested to hear what you recommend to your patients. Some things that I recommend to mine, we've already talked about, keep electronics out of the bedroom, mm -hmm. try not to use them at least an hour, if not longer, before bed. Um, exercise during the day can be an incredible way to help the body uh, process stress hormones and unwind and, and really allow for better sleep when it's time to go to sleep. Um, and then also routine. Making sure you go to bed um, and rise around at the same time, even on the weekends, can be really useful. And children are key for routine. If you start a child very Absolutely. early about when they eat their meal, you know, having dinner at a certain time and then bath time and then story time when they know this is the time now to go to sleep and to get into that routine. I think as adults we need the same. We I, do, I think. We really, really do. What would your recommendations be? Well, we mentioned the importance of melatonin. Yes. So what we want to think of is that day or the light darkness concept, mm. which I'd like to reassure and, and kind of reinforce. And then the second level would be the adrenal, which is a gland that is right beside the kidneys, which is constantly pumping adrenaline. And that gland really needs to take a break. Mm. It has actually a matched to the sleep cycle. And when somebody is not sleeping, the adrenal gland also can be affected. But into more specifically, I think as the day goes down, as the light starts dimming on the outside, we want to think of actually having had some daylight exposure. Mm. When you mentioned exercise, people who exercise after 8 p.m. have a hard time Going to calming sleep. down and bringing their body down That's after a good exercising. Point. Doing it too late won't be helpful. Right, exactly. right. I recommend usually to at least doing it at before 6 p.m. Mm. or trying to find methods. Another one that I think you can elaborate on is guided imagery. Absolutely. So I think maybe you want to tell yeah, us. Yeah, I how? do. I would <laughs> love to. Well, I think one of the things before we even get to guided imagery, if I may, is to talk about the environment that you sleep in. Absolutely. That plays a huge part. If your environment, if your sleep environment is very cluttered, that energetically doesn't give you the freedom and the openness to be able to relax. Your bedroom, where you sleep, must be kind of your special place, a place that nurtures and nourishes you in that mm -hmm. sense to allow that. So what you have in that atmosphere is really important, that it not be very busy, that it is soothing. Mm -hmm. And for some people that they have, some people really need those dark screening 
a curtain so that it is dark, as well as if you have lots of lights because of all the different equipment that you have around you, to be able to cover them right. so you don't have those lights around. And even from the point of view, of, they say that if you have mirrors opposite where you are sleeping and that you're actually looking into them or they're behind you, the best thing you can do is cover them wow. because of the energy that's circulating in the room. Is that that it a will, feng shui concept? It is a oh, feng shui yeah. concept yeah. that I learned from a colleague. And that's a very important thing to know. And also that you have peaceful pictures around you, those that you want. But your bed, the bed that you sleep in, that it's comfortable and it's supportive. And then you have people who, if it's very hot, and they don't have air conditioning, temperature control. heat, mm. temperature control. We were joking, but it's true. When it's yeah. really hot, cold showers. That's what right. I do, cold <laughs> showers. And Hormones. Dry, right? Right. <laughs> so things like that. But you mentioned guided imagery. Guided imagery is a beautiful thing to be able to do to help the body settle in. So let's say if we, we have trouble sleeping, one of the best things that we might be able to do is take a nice shower mm. or a nice bath. An with, Epsom salt bath the Epsom with salt lavender bath. essential oil. There you Absolutely. go. Recommend that sometimes. The aromas. And be, the, uh, like the senses, bringing the senses exactly. down. Exactly. Children, adolescents, adults, elderly, we all need that. We really do. So if we take the time to have a nice bath or a shower so we're nice and clean, we put on our comfortable pajamas or whatever we are, and we, when we get into bed to realize this is our time to unwind, to, and one of the things that helps us is stress is if we haven't taken care of the things that we need mm -hmm. to take care of and we haven't um, kept up with things, then at bedtime we're thinking about and then we can be more stressful. So being on top of getting things done helps. What do you think of journaling perhaps to process some of that before? Journaling is a that. phenomenal yeah. thing. It's wonderful. And also I also recommend for people, keep some index cards by your bedside and a pen and a little flashlight so that you, know, you don't wake up your loved ones or whoever you're with so that if in the middle of the night you remember something you forgot, you can quickly jot it down and then be able to go back to sleep. This way you've taken care of it. You know you'll get to it in the morning. It's a wonderful way. But if we can get into bed and relax and use our breath, our breath is another key component. Breathing is key. It is key mm -hmm. to help us to relax because our breath is like a conductor is to an orchestra. It signals to our body it's time to relax and to just be present with ourselves and allow ourselves to sleep because we know that sleep really helps to revitalize us. And that's when the body does its most healing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. At Absolutely. times of sleep. So from a guided imagery point of view, if there's a special place that you have been to or that you really enjoy that allows you to be peaceful, you feel supported, loved, and mm -hmm. all of that, it's a great thing to think of that. Think of that restful, peaceful place. For some people, it might be at the ocean. Mm -hmm. It might be taking a walk, a walk on the ocean, just slowly walking and relaxing, or just imagining themselves lying down on a comfortable lounge chair, lying down and breathing in the wonderful smells of the fresh ocean air. So from a guided Im imagery point of view, if we went with the ocean and imagine ourselves in our comfortable bed, just lying there, and we can actually start with an ocean breath where we breathe in, I always, my mantra is breathe in peace, breathe out calm, but we take a nice breath. Hey, and then we're sleepy. <laughs> you sound like the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Inhaling it out. So you get to the breath and then you see yourself lying in that beautiful place, feeling that ocean smelling the ocean, lovely scent of the aromas. seas, the aromas, feeling the ocean breeze against your body, allowing yourself, hearing the seagulls, and just allowing yourself to slowly say to your head, it's time for you now to relax. So you're really training the mind training to Training the mind to go to each part of the body mm -hmm. to totally relax and, you and can let go. You can think of nature. You nature. can listen to birds. I mean, anything. You can create any reality anything. within your mind. Mm -hmm. With exactly, exactly. How do you do it? Uh, my guided imagery. There we go. One or your your way of 
of resting to go to sleep. One thing that's been helpful for me, because I used to really struggle with insomnia through a lot of my life, and um, two things have been helpful. One is similar to what you're describing. I would breathe in and picture the breath going all the way to my toes. Yeah. And then as I exhale, I feel my toes relax. Yeah. And then with the next breath, I bring it into the balls of my feet. And perfect. as I exhale, the balls of my feet relax. Yeah. And I slowly work my way That's up perfect. my body. And I'm usually asleep by the time I get somewhere in my torso. Yeah. And if I'm not, if it was a stressful day, I'll do it again. Um, the next thing that's been helpful for me is a Qigong practice. Qigong yeah. is uh, from the martial art lineage, but it's much more meditative. And there's a very simple technique that you can use, and it's like um, if you were to beat the dust off of a rug, the idea is you almost do it to yourself, and you tap yourself just head to toe, and you make sure you get the back of your neck, and it's supposed to help balance the nervous system. And I've actually found it to be true. I've found it to be helpful. And Very I've taught helpful. it to some patients. Yeah, that's, and that's wonderful. Nice. Another wonderful tool is an energy technique called Reiki. And by laying on of hands, of placing hands in particular areas, like over the heart, over the eyes, on top of the head, it's a form of touch therapy, and even by the solar plexus, it allows the body to calm down and allows it to go into that beautiful state of sleep. Now, we know from an elder perspective, some people, as they age, require less sleep. And some, then, you have people that uh, get into a whole cycle of some problems called sundowning. Can you speak to that related to what happens regarding that and so, the changes that are going on as we age? Yes, very importantly, I wanted to kind of wrap up what you both mentioned, which was extremely important, is the self-care. Yes. The actual personal predisposition to bringing yourself down. Like what we do with toddlers, we, like you said, in terms of programming. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go into now medical situations that mm -hmm. require problems regarding sleep, insomnia, mm -hmm. and especially sound downing, what happens is the transition between light to dark can create some confusion. Absolutely. And when they start feeling these confusions, they feel disoriented. And, and scared. And very scared. Very and sometimes they can get aggressive. Yes. And so that's one very important concept because that is a not necessarily an early sign of dementia, but yet on the other hand, it can be a sign of other medical conditions as well. Like, for example, in the elderly, if they have a urinary tract infection, mm -hmm. this sundowning or this transition from the day to night can be much more pronounced. Depression can cause a, a, a presentation like this. Hyperthyroidism can create a severe insomnia situation. Mm -hmm. And so when we have tried all these things and they seem not to work, I think it's really important to bring it to your medical attention. Absolutely. Great. And then last, I'd like to transition to one more, which is a very common problem now, which is sleep apnea. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sleep apnea is a humongous problem in the sense that, um, number one, getting a study is a big situation. Number two, if you live alone, you wouldn't realize if you have this problem, what does sleep apnea mean? What happens is that when you go to sleep, the body might have an occlusion in the mouth, might have a problem with the neck size, maybe with higher weight uh, patients or people who are obese or have a weight problem. Their weight can push too hard on their lungs, and so there's two types. There's the central, where the brain actually forgets to breathe, mm. and then there's peripheral, where there's obstructions to the breath. So sleep apnea is a condition where actually people, again, can die. Because if you add sleep apnea to maybe some alcohol drinking, I have seen people in the 20s who would actually pass away from their body just simply not remembering or not activating itself to, to take a deep breath. And there are tests that people can go to their doctors and they can prescribe them where they can actually see what's going on with their sleep cycle to see if they need some of this equipment that's available that people can have related to bringing in oxygen right, into the them and helping them. And even before that, I've come across some studies that uh, just even 10% of your body fat weight loss can be very Absolutely. helpful for sleep apnea. So sometimes even before the CPAP machine, uh, a little bit of weight loss can go a long way in terms of and, and with sleep the C, apnea. With, with the CPAP machines, the interesting concept is that it's evolving on a daily basis. Mm. So some people have machines that are five years old, and they can be quite obsolete at this point. So mm. when I usually tell them, it's a good idea if you have been diagnosed 
to continue to see your sleep doctor at least every three years at the least, but don't go more than three without having readjusted. For example, if you lose a significant amount of weight, the settings in the machine need to change. So it's very important to keep in close communication. Sleep medicine is a field that is growing exponentially simply because People might think that sleep is uh, overrated right. and might just try priority. to buy some time. Yes. And that's not a, not a good idea so, at all. So as a summary, so that as our listening audience is taking in what they can do, it sounds as if it's really important that um, everybody kind of sets a set time in a sense that they try to get to bed by so that they can start the process and be able to get a good Keep night's sleep. Keep their environment clear Keep and their check environment. in with your doctor if check that doesn't work. Check in with your doctor. Yeah, absolutely. And, and people that have trouble with snoring and things like that, there are things that can help them too to get the support and the breathing and everything else and to eat a healthy diet. I think one of the things as far as food is concerned, you really don't want to eat after dinner into the late, anything that's going to keep you up, anything right. sweet or sugary or anything that's going to... Anything stimulating. Anything stimulating at all. What else would you like to wrap up with so that people know? I think this is such a topic that I love our conversations, but we would love to invite our, our audience to send us some questions. Absolutely. Because we can go in a whole session about the different aspects of sleep all the way to the insomnia, sleep apnea and sundowning. And what to do about it. And yes. what to do about each of them. And so if you have questions and want further information, you would send it to info at ycdholistichealing.com. And we welcome your questions and also your desire to learn more about a variety of topics. So it's important to remember that sleep is a priority for you to eat well, to rest and to know that during your sleep time cycle, that is a time where your body, your muscles, and all of your being is having the opportunity to be nurtured and nourished and heal. And it's reset, a healing absolutely. time and reset. So on behalf of all of us, we wish you a wonderful, wonderful day. And we ask you, please, take each day one day at a time. Surround yourself with positive people, positive experiences, and make positive choices and be the person that takes care of you in the best way possible. Make the choices that help you to lead a healthy and happy life. For all of us, we wish you good health and much happiness. See you soon. The preceding program